So, welcome to our EDU Onyx programming course on C socket programming. So, in this course, we're going to cover sockets and some of the low level networking concepts surrounding them. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the C sockets API and the functions that are necessary to create sockets that will both act as clients and servers in various networking applications. This course assumes some basic uh, fundamental knowledge about the C programming language. We're going to be using things like functions, loops, uh, basic aspects of the C programming language. So this knowledge is going to be helpful when we start dealing with socket code. Before we get too deep into the socket API, the different functions that we're going to need to be calling in order to set up sockets, the first thing that we'll look at very quickly is why sockets are important in network programming. So sockets are basically the low-level connection endpoint. They're the way that you can create a connection between any two computers, essentially. And uh, there's a lot of protocols that sit on top of sockets. So things like TCP, which is our low-level networking protocol. And on top of that is built the high-level networking protocols like HTTP, uh, the protocol that we use when we browse the web and FTP, uh, what you might use to upload files, or in a bunch of different cases, uh, there's a lot of protocols that sit on top of the basic socket functionality. So these are some of the reasons why sockets are important. With just basic socket programming and uh, these C APIs, you can implement applications that do any of these things. You can create web servers, web clients, uh, FTP clients, Anything that interacts with the network can be built using the basic socket building block. So to start off, we're going to look at how to build a client socket. And I have client in quotations here because uh, a socket is a two-way endpoint. So you can both send and receive information on any socket. There's no such thing as just a client socket or just a server socket. Um, the socket is basically dependent on how you intend to use it. So we're going to build a client, so to speak, that will send and receive some data from a server, basically another socket endpoint. So the API that we're going to be looking at, um, there's a workflow that looks like this. So in order to create a client socket connection, uh, the first part in any socket programming is you have to create the socket itself. In C, there's this socket function that you use. Um, you can store the result of that socket function in an integer, and that's basically a descriptor, um, and that's how we're going to refer to our socket. That integer will allow us to make any future calls on our particular socket after we've made this socket call. Uh, this, in the socket call, we specify basically the type of socket. In this case, we're going to work with TCP in our client and server. Uh, this will be a little bit easier since there's a lot of applications that will allow us to see TCP traffic and interact with it without having to write a whole bunch of extra tools in order to see what we're actually doing on the network. So when we create our socket, and we'll look at this in the actual code later, we specify what type and the protocol and sort of the domain. And these are kind of the basic things that we need to know to create the socket. After the socket's created, we need to connect it to some remote address. And that's basically where we specify the IP and the port that we're going to connect the socket to. From there, um, once it's connected, if we have a successful connection, uh, you'll get back a return value that indicates that your connection was successful, and then you can start sending and receiving data. Uh, for our client, in this case, we'll just have receive here, uh, since we'll have something else send it data. Or, in some cases, like if you're writing an HTTP client, you might send first, make a request, and then receive data back as a response. But this receive function allows us to get data back from wherever the other side of the connection. Whatever's on the other side of the connection, we can receive that data, and then we can print it out, store it, write it to a file, do whatever we want. We can read that data back basically into a string and then see what it looks like, do whatever we want with it. So before we jump right into actually doing some socket programming, uh, one thing I want to mention really quick is for simplicity, we're going to be doing all of our socket development here on a Linux environment. Uh, this would also work under Windows if you use SigWin and GCC. It's, it's going to be the exact same commands. Uh, doing this under Linux is going to be a little bit easier uh, since the tools and compiler and everything we're going to need is going to be already included in our operating system. 
Uh, but if you want to use these same tools on Windows, uh, you can use the SIGWIN environment and GCC, and the commands will be the exact same. You can basically compile your code in the same way and run it in the same way. And the libraries and API will be pretty much the same as well. Um, but for the purposes of this course, we're going to focus on doing this in a Linux environment. So to get started, we're going to create our TCP client file. going to be using Vim as an editor here um, just to keep it simple. So we're going to need to include some things from the standard library, uh, standard IO and standard lib. We're going to need to include types and socket.h for definitions about the socket functions that we're going to be using. Um, socket.h is going to contain most of the important functionality and the API that we're going to be using to create our sockets. So, uh, those includes look like this. And for some structures that we're going to need to store address information, we're going to need a header file called in.h under net inet. And then we can create our main function. So just as a quick double check before we keep going, these are all the includes you're going to need in order to make sure that you have all of the calls and types specified. So you'll need uh, standard IO, standard library, and types and socket.h and then make sure you include that in.h library. So once you've got all those ready we can get started. So in this example we're going to start writing our TCP client and we're going to use the workflow that we described uh, based on that diagram that we saw a little bit earlier in the slides. So first we need to create the socket and that's the simple part. Uh, we can use an integer to hold the socket descriptor and that basically is what's going to contain the information about our socket. Let's call this network socket, just to be verbose here. But you can call this whatever you actually want. And then you call the socket function, like we showed earlier in the diagram, and uh, you store the result of it in this integer. I'm going to comment this just so it's extra clear exactly what's happening at each step. So you call the socket function like this. The first parameter is basically the, the domain of the socket. We're going to, since it's an internet socket, we'll pass af underscore inet, uh, and that's a constant that's been defined elsewhere for us to use in one of our header files. Sock stream is going to be the type of the socket, and that basically means it's a TCP socket, a connection socket, as opposed to a datagram socket, which is basically what the UDP protocol is. They work a little differently, um, TCP versus UDP, but in this case we're going to be using TCP. So the constant that we're going to use, it's already been defined, is going to be called sock underscore stream. And the last parameter specifies a protocol, 
We're just going to use zero here since we're already using, we already basically have to be using TCP. There's some other cases where you might not, we might want to specify the protocol explicitly, like if you're using raw sockets, which are sockets independent of an actual uh, protocol in the way that we've been using them here. But we're going to specify zero. That means we're using the default protocol, TCP. So this is actually all you need to do to set up the socket. So this creates the network socket. And from here, we can start calling the other functions on it. So this creates one of the endpoints needed to create a network communication. And since this is going to be our client, we're going to have to write another one of these on the other end that we can interact with and maybe send data to or receive data from. But basically, so this is one side of the network communication. So we need to now connect it to another side, basically, another socket. So in order to connect to another socket, we need to call the connect function that we talked about. But before we can get to call and connect, we need to actually be able to specify an address to connect to. So that's why we needed this net inet header. It contains a structure that we can define a few fields on so that we know the address and the port of the particular remote socket that we're going to connect to, the other one. So let's start creating that address structure and specify where we want to connect to. So we de declare the structure for the address like this. So first we have to specify an address family. It'll be the same as uh, the family of our socket. That's AF underscore INET. That's the first parameter that we passed in. So uh, we have a couple fields that we need to define on this sock address in structure. Um, and the first one is going to be the family, and it looks like this. It's just SIN underscore family. So this sets the family of the address, so it knows what type of address we are working with here. Um, then we actually need to specify the port that we're going to connect to. And it's the field, again, on that structure is sin underscore port. So we could pass the port in as an integer, but the data format is slightly different from the structure that we need to kind of use a conversion function, but since we've included all the appropriate headers, it's already here. The conversion function, that's going to put the uh, our integer port that we've passed in in the right network byte order is called H-T-O-N-S. Um, that's H-T-O-N-S, and it looks kind of like this. So as a parameter to this function, we pass the actual port number, then this function takes care of converting it to the appropriate data format so that our structure can understand the port number and we know exactly where we're supposed to be connecting to. So uh, let's specify some port that we know isn't going to be in use by our operating system. There's a bunch that might be, so let's use something high. We use a 9001 or 9002. So that's all you have to do to specify the port that you want to connect to remotely. Now that you have this, uh, you finally need to specify the actual address. And in our case, that's basically going to be like the IP address. Uh, in some cases, uh, you might be familiar with, if you want to bind to any address on your local computer, you can use the IP 0.0.0.0. .0 um, but we're not going to need to explicitly specify any network address. There's a shortcut really already there for us. So we're going to use that. So the next field that we're going to define on the structure for a server address after the port is going to be, like I said, the actual address, and it looks like this. So 
There's a field, sin underscore address, that's sin underscore addr, but that field itself is actually a structure that contains a field, so we can use another dot to get into the field within this structure. So, just so it's not too complicated, server address is a structure holding some information about the address. In here, this sin addr is a structure itself, and that contains one field holding the address itself. The data of the address that we are trying to connect to. And that field is called s underscore addr. So that's the real server address that we're going to be connecting to. And we're going to just connect to our local machine. We'll write another TCP server to handle the connections from this TCP client. So since we're going to do that, we can use any address that's being used on our local machine. We can use that shortcut that we talked about, the IP of 0.0.0.0, .0 but we have a step better than that. There's already a shortcut for that in the library, and it's called inaddr underscore any, which is the same thing as trying to connect to 0000. So this is basically all the information you need to actually define the address that you want to connect to remotely. So from here you can actually call the connect function. So the first parameter that it takes is our actual socket. So we can pass that in. And then we're going to need to cast our server address structure to a slightly different structure. Um, here it's a struct sockaddr underscore in. We're going to need to cast it to a struct just sockaddr. Um, and that cast just looks like this. Oh, it needs to be a pointer to one, so we're going to need to pass the address too. So this casts our address to the right structure type, and we're passing a pointer to it, to this connect function. And then the last parameter to connect is the size of the address. So we can use the size of function to get that and pass it in as our third parameter. So one thing to note is connect returns an integer uh, that lets us know whether the connection is successful or not. So we can kind of use that to do some primitive error handling here. So we can assign it to an integer. And basically the way it works is if you get a value of zero, everything's okay. If you get a value of negative one, then there is some error with the connection and it wasn't able to connect properly. So uh, let's print out uh, a message to the user if something goes wrong with that connection. So we can create a simple if statement that checks and make sure that everything is okay with the connection. We'll just print a message to the user, in this case using the printf function from the standard library. So that way the user will know that something went wrong with the connection. So if you remember correctly, the next thing that we do once we have the connection is if we either send or receive data. In the workflow diagram from the slides, we received some data from the server. So in order to do that, we need to call the receive function like we saw from those slides, and it's spelled that way, R-E-C-V. So that function looks kind of like this. So the first parameter that we pass to it is our socket, once again. And 
And then we need some place to hold the data that we get back. So let's create a string uh, to hold some information that we might get back from the server. So let's make that look like this. So we have a string with nothing in it, and we're going to then pass the address of that into the receive function, and that's where the data that we get back from the server will end up. So the second parameter to this receive function is the location that we want to put the actual data that we get back from our socket. And then we pass the size of that particular data. In this case, we're just going to use the size of the buffer. The size of the server response, or however much space we have to put characters in here. And then there's an optional flags parameter, uh, which we're going to leave at zero for right now. since we're not putting anything fancy in there. And then the last thing that we might want to do is, since we've received data from the server successfully, we're going to print out the data that we get back. use a format string and just let the user know what we got back. And then after we're done, we can actually close the socket with a close function. And that function is really simple. Um, it just takes one parameter and that's the socket once again. So that's it. This is a really basic TCP client that will print out any data that we get from a remote connection. So in order to test this, we're going to need another socket. We're going to write a TCP server to send some data to this client and uh, make sure that that data gets printed out to the screen. And the workflow is going to be kind of the same, but there will be a few differences in terms of the functions that we need to call. So let's look at the workflow for the TCP server. All right, so now we have our client application, but we need somewhere to have another socket endpoint so we can actually make a network connection. So we need a server side of the socket. So the API function calls and the workflow is a little bit different. So first, uh, like in the client, we create a socket with the socket function call. It works the same way. We store it in an integer, and that basically allows us to perform some functions on our socket. But the next call is different. We need to bind the IP and port for that particular socket. So in the same way that we had a socket address that we needed to connect to using the connect function, the bind will basically specify where our socket is going to listen for connections instead of where it's going to remotely connect to to send and receive data. It's a little bit different. So on the server side, um, we bind the IP and port using a similar structure. It will be the exact same structure. We specify the same IP and port for the other side of the socket connection. Uh, and then we call this listen function that allows us to listen for connections. And then we call an accept function that allows us to get another socket, which basically lets us then perform these functions on the client side. So from there, we'll get another socket, another integer, and then we can call functions on that socket, like reading and writing data. So from there, 
after we add that client socket, we are going to call the send or receive functions, and that is how we will make data show up on the client side of the socket. We create a socket the same way, we bind it to an IP import this time, instead of calling the connect function. And then we listen for connections, which basically will allow us to see if any sockets try to connect to our server socket. Then we accept the connection, which will return to us another socket that we can then perform the read and write operations on to get data and read data from the socket. So using a very similar structure, we can start programming our server. So let's start doing that. So we can create another C file for our TCP server. And we're going to have mostly the same exact includes as we did before. We'll need to include all of those standard library files, uh, basically everything that we had before because we're going to be performing mostly the same operations, a few different ones, but most of the functions that we have are already defined in all of the includes that we had before, so we'll use mainly the same ones. So once again, we include standard IO, standard library, socket and types.h from the net package, and then net inet in.h. So first we will create a string to hold the data that we're going to send to all the clients. So we'll create a simple string to hold the text that we're going to send to any clients that connect. And then we can start creating our socket in the same way. We create an integer to hold the return value of our socket call. Then we make the socket call. It's pretty much the same as before, same parameters. Still an internet socket and still a TCP socket, so we use AFI net and sock stream. And we can still set the protocol to zero. It's good to comment things just to keep them clean. So once again, in the same way, we define that address structure. The type is struct sock ADDR in and then we'll call this server address like we did before and once again pretty much the same parameters. Uh, the family is going to stay as AF INET the IP, the actual address is going to stay as any address because both of these connections are going to be on the local machine. We want them to actually connect to each other. And then we'll use the same port, 9002, I believe. We need to call the same function to convert the data format of the port. It'll be 9002. And 
and then finally the actual address. We're using this INADDR any constant, which basically will resolve to any IP address on the local machine. So once we've done that, we can call the bind function in almost the exact same way as we called the connect function. Um, so that'll look like this. So first we pass the socket. And then we cast our address in the exact same way that we did before. And then finally, the last parameter will once again be the size of the server address. So now our socket is bound to an IPM port, so we can listen for connections using the listen function. So we call the listen function to start listening for connections. That function takes our server socket. And then the second argument is actually a backlog, which is how many connections can be waiting uh, essentially for this particular socket at one point in time. Uh, since we know we're only going to be using this with one particular client program, um, we can set this number to whatever, it doesn't really matter so long as it's at least one. Or I'm going to use five here, but it shouldn't matter what you use really. Uh, this might be important when if you start writing network applications that have to deal with lots of traffic. But in this case, this is a small example, so this number doesn't really matter. And then finally, we're now going to create uh, an integer to hold the client socket, because once we are able to listen for connections, we can start actually accepting connections. And when you accept a connection, what we get back is the client socket that we're then going to write to. So then we call this accept function and set the return value equal to our client socket. So now we'll get the socket that we can do whatever we want with. So the client socket will be equal to the result of the accept function. So when we're able to listen for connections, we accept a connection. And after we've accepted that connection, we get back a socket that allows us to manipulate anything on the client side. So we now have a two-way connection with the client and server. Um, we can both send and receive data both ways. So in order to accept, we our first parameter is the socket that we are accepting connections on. That's our server socket. And then the next two parameters are, we're not going to fill in, I'm going to pass null into both of them, but they are structures that would contain the address of the client connection. The first parameter is anyway a structure and then a size for an address of the client. So if you want to figure out where your client is connecting from, you can pass a structure into here and it will fill up the data of that particular structure, uh, similar to the socket address that we did for binding the actual socket, it'll fill that data up with information about where this connection is coming from. But since we know and we don't really need this information, it's not uh, interesting to us because it's just our local machine, I'm going to leave these both as null. So now we have a client socket that we can send data to. So let's send the message that we defined earlier to our client socket. So 
So the send call looks like this. We first pass the socket that we're sending data on. That's the first parameter. The second thing that we need to send is the actual data that we want to send to this particular client socket. Since we have our server message variable already defined, we can send that. And then we need to specify the size of the message. And we can do that with the size of function on our server message. And then I believe there's also an optional flags parameter here as well, which we won't need for this case. So once we've done that, we've finished our server application and we can close the socket. So now once we've got this running, we should have a two-way connection between the client and server. And uh, we can test this with two terminal windows and make sure everything works appropriately. So let's do that. So uh, now I've split the screen into two parts. On the left-hand side, we're going to have a terminal window that runs the TCP server program that we've just compiled. Uh, I just did that with make. So after you're done with the code... You can compile it by using make and then tcp server. Uh, mine is already up to date. And the same thing for the client now that we're done with the code. So they're both compiled and up to date now. So first I'm going to start the tcp server. So as you can see, on the right side, we got the data printed out, the message that the server was sending out to any clients that connected. And on the left side, uh, nothing happened. We don't have any output from our server. Uh, no error messages or anything like that. So as you can see, what we've been able to do here is make a low-level connect network connection over the TCP protocol between two sockets and be able to communicate back and forth with uh, the functions that we looked at, like send and receive. We can actually send data both ways. We can both send data to the server and receive data from the server. And the same on the client side, we can both send and receive data. So this is how we create a basic low-level network communication set up between two applications. And what we'll look at in the next lesson is how we can start implementing some of the higher-level protocols, like HTTP, for instance. If we want to request uh, particular web pages, we can build it on top of the framework that we've already started with these particular clients uh, using the same set of calls and just a few changes we can make an application that will request and return to us the results from any web page on the internet so this is the basics of setting up socket programming in C we've looked at both client and server interaction and communication uh, if you are running these examples on Linux and have further questions about any of the functions that we've looked at so far, uh, I would advise you to take a quick look at the manual pages. They give a lot of detail and information about any of the functions that we've looked at. If you just type uh, man and then the name of one of the functions, uh, you'll get a page describing the parameters. Uh, for instance, here we can look at the one for socket. And we have a documentation page describing uh, in a lot of detail more of what each of the parameters are for the socket function, what all of them do, and what the things here specify. Uh, so for more information, you can take a look at these pages for any of the functions that we've looked at so far. That's it for this lesson.